<coughs> first, let me just get a time frame from you. Does anybody have to leave particularly early? Because um, the last slide is a slide of sort of, okay, you know, what does this mean to you and how can you get involved? So, um, <clears throat> INSTEAD is the first spinoff of Google.org. And for those of you who don't know, Google.org is the, basically the charitable operation of, of Google.com. And it has a current asset base of about $2 billion that the founders set up to pursue charitable activities. And one of the charitable activities that they elected to get involved with was being the founding grantor for an organization that we'll talk about today called INSTEAD. And we've subsequently received support from a broad range of other organizations, but Google is our original sponsor and the institution to which we owe our existence. <clears throat> what we want to do with INSTEAD is to basically bring the information age <clears throat> to bear on the problems of disaster response around the world. And you're a bright audience. I'm not going to spend my time reading what's on the slides. Just glance through them. You'll get some feel for the kinds of things that we hope to do. Most disaster organizations, and, and Dan is a perfect example of this, are composed of individuals who are incredibly dedicated to trying to reach out to people in the world uh, who, through no fault of their own, find themselves in the midst of a calamity. The difficulty is that disaster organizations are organizations which have a very episodic demand for their services. And as a consequence, they typically are under-resourced. And only when a disaster occurs does everybody sort of say, okay, how can we help? And, and then it's too late, because when the people go out the door to deal with the disaster, they don't have time to get connected with the people who want to help. You are in a company that is immersed in technology, and you take technology for granted. Most of the people in the disaster community are operating probably 10 to 20 years behind where you are when you go back to your desk today. And that's just the nature of the business which is also frequently compounded by the fact that in a disaster setting, frequently access to communications is usually degraded, if not totally eliminated. So INSTEAD's mission is to try to be a facilitator to work with all of the disaster organizations in the world and to give them better tools so that they can be more efficient and more, eff more efficient and more effective in the things that they have chosen to do. And there are literally tens of thousands of organizations around the world who perceive their mission being some form of disaster response, disaster recovery. Some of them are large organizations like UNICEF. Others are very small organizations. And when a disaster occurs, frequently many of these organizations will all show up at the same place at the same time in an incredibly uncoordinated but incredibly well-meaning fashion. And so what we hope to do is to be a totally independent entity, independent of any company, any government, any other institution, and to try to bring together all the tools that the technology community has to offer to help the people who are, in fact, responding to disasters around the world. And hopefully in the process of doing that, one of the things we'll also do is increase the probability that these organizations will work more effectively together because they'll be using the same tools, communicating the same way. <clears throat> now the range of disasters that we're looking at, infectious diseases, man-made physical disasters, famine, human rights abuses, and natural disasters, and for each one of those, four categories, the prevention, preparedness, mitigation phase, which is the thing that you try to do ahead of time to make sure that we as a world are better prepared. Typically, this function is dramatically underfunded, and we don't do nearly as much as we should in terms of prevention, preparedness, or mitigation. Surveillance, we do surveillance reasonably well with infectious diseases. We don't do surveillance very well for most of the other things that are listed here. There is, in fact, a famine watch system that does a reasonably good job uh, we're getting a little bit better at predicting things like earthquakes and, and tsunamis that 
result as a consequence of earthquakes. Uh, we don't do nearly as well with respect to human rights abuses. In fact, most people would not normally categorize those as disasters. We as human beings tend to think when an airplane crashes and 300 people get killed, that's a disaster. And yet in the same hour that that airplane crashed with 300 people, there were many more people killed around the world by disease, by famine, by human rights abuses. And yet the human mind tends to focus in and say, well, if it doesn't happen in a split second at one point in time, it's not a disaster. We have tried to define the definition of disaster so much more broadly than that. So that's why we include things like human rights abuses uh, and famine. <clears throat> what, we're, what we're in the process of doing, working with companies like Google, and we'll talk about some of our other technology partners, is finding the best tools that you have and making those tools freely available to the disaster community. Not only freely available to them, but also working with them to help them in the adoption of those tools. So we perceive ourselves as facilitating the interface between technology and human needs in a crisis. <clears throat> Most of our original tools, by virtue of our birthplace being Google, are, are Google apps with, with which many of you in this room are familiar. And we are in the process of doing something very analogous to Google for Educators, which is basically Google for disaster responders. And we're taking the tools that exist here, and I apologize for this slide, it's probably the toughest one to read, you won't have any more like that. But we're checking all the different tools that Google has and we're trying to package them together, customize them so that they meet the needs of the disaster community, and then making them freely available to that entire community with strong support from Google. <clears throat> One of the things that we've been spending a lot of time on the last five or six months is talking to the customer, making sure we understand what their needs are. And it's been eye-opening because when you talk to people who are actually in this business on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you begin to realize uh, what an incredible opportunity advanced technology brings to the table. Um, but you're also incredibly impressed with what these people do, many of them without the kinds of tools that you and I take for granted on an everyday basis. So we have six initial projects. Um, the consultation, which I just described, the tools and technology, which is basically what we're, we're, we're talking about, developing a toolkit. And with Google being the main supplier, but IBM and, and a number of other organizations coming on board, I'll talk a little bit later in this presentation about one of our partners, which is NASA. And NASA is doing some very exciting things with us and with Google. But having tools doesn't mean anything unless you can demonstrate that they work. And so we have chosen three test sites around the world. Uh, one of them <clears throat> is right here in New York City, and it's the one that Dan operates, which is the 24-hour emergency operations center of UNICEF. And when you walk into that room, uh, you see the tools that they have, and you realize that here's an incredible opportunity for us to bring modern information technology and high-speed connections and all sorts of other kinds of things in to facilitate them doing the job that they do. The second test site we've chosen for a couple of reasons, one of which is its physical proximity. Uh, the second, because it is a, an activity which if it's successful can be easily replicated, is we're working with one of the 28 national urban search and rescue teams. The one that happens to be located in Menlo Park, California. Uh, quite close to both the Mountain View campus and Instead's headquarters in Palo Alto. And that urban search and rescue team is the, one of the teams that came here to New York City for the World Trade Center. They went to Oklahoma City, they went to Katrina. Uh, they were responsible for the recovery of the Columbia astronauts. In each of these cases, <clears throat> uh, they went out the door with roadmaps from AAA. Um, they had no basically high technology the people at Google during Katrina were pumping incredible imagery out the door and it went down to a desk in Louisiana and sat on the desk because nobody had made the connection between the people who were providing that invaluable information and the people who were actually in the field doing the work. 
And when we first introduced the people from Menlo Park to the people from Google, there was great sadness because the people at Google said, well, we sent all this stuff to you. And the people at Menlo Park said, but we never got it. And nothing happens in a disaster situation that hasn't been pretty well thought through ahead of time. The people who go out the door go out the door with the tools they have. And if somebody else shows up and says, I've got something great for you, they say, look, we don't have time for great things right now. We've got a job to do. And so there's a big disconnect there. And so that's one of the challenges that we face in Project 3. And we'll come back at the very end and talk about how those of you who want to might get involved in Project 3 in general, and particularly getting involved in what we're doing here with UNICEF and Dan and his team. <clears throat> Project 4 is one of the efforts that we're undertaking in the preparedness mitigation area. Uh, there's a reasonably good chance, probably a higher chance now than any time in the last 20 or 30 years that the world will see a pandemic flu situation much like 1918. If that occurs, it will change the way that you and I live. It will overwhelm the healthcare system, not only of this country, but of every country in the world. And one of the things that will happen is that you and I as individuals will be responsible for taking care of ourselves and our families without recourse to 911, without recourse to doctors, without recourse to hospitals. And we just made the decision that one of the things that we would do is create a online manual that any citizen could use to figure out how they could take care of themselves and their family in these circumstances. And that'll be finished and published online on the 1st of July of this year. A federation is being created of the technology partners and the disaster responders to come together to identify opportunities for collaboration and needs. And then a situational awareness project. One of the things that we don't do particularly well because we tend to look at disasters as disjointed little things that happen all by themselves, we don't have a good overview of what's happening around the world. And one of the most powerful tools for human beings is to help visualize that thing, things like that, are things like Google Maps and Google Earth. Now, when you can just imagine the world where every single hotspot is now shows up on, on a Google Earth presentation, and you can look at a famine overlay, you can look at a natural disaster overlay, you can look at a human rights abuse overlay, and you can begin to get some sense of really what's happening in the world, not just simply on, by what you see on CNN, but by having, <clears throat> hopefully, raw data from the point of the disaster being transmitted and posted in such a way that as all that information aggregates, we really get a good feel for what's happening around the world. Won't spend any time on this. Uh, these are the team members. Uh, I'm one of the five directors of INSTEAD. Um, I agreed to serve in that capacity on, with the understanding that it was a uh, one board meeting a quarter. And uh, shortly thereafter, my colleagues said, well, gee, Peter, we need somebody to run this organization. And I'm not spending about five hours a day as an unpaid volunteer, uh, as the president of INSTEAD, which I hope was going to be a temporary role. Certainly my wife does. And we also have some people from the Google.org organization who work directly with us and spend about half of their time, each of the three people listed there. These are the organizations, the response organizations that we're dealing with, the donors and the technology providers that we are beginning to collaborate with in order to accomplish this mission. And one of them you'll see here is NASA Ames. And I've chosen that just simply as an illustration. And I apologize for this slide. It got a bit scrunched up. <clears throat> but what NASA Ames is trying to do, these are the people who basically are responsible for running you know, deep space missions. And so you know, the people that we deal with at NASA Ames are the people that are in charge of robotics. And it just seems like a sort of a strange thing. But these are people that are really very good at trying to get information from a distance and presenting that information so that you can make decisions about it. And so they're taking the technology that's been developed for the space program, and they're saying, how can we apply this technology to disasters here on, on, on the face of the Earth? And what, they've, what they're doing is they're using a lot of stuff, KML overlays with Google Earth, et cetera, 
to look at things like landslides and Katrina and things like that so that people now have really good real-time information. Instead of sending our people to Katrina with AAA maps, uh, we're setting it up now where there'll be an immediate download once the alert comes in to all of the laptops of the people who are going out the door of all the information that's available in Google Earth. And then we'll begin to do overlays so that they have contemporaneous information it's updated every six hours or 12 hours or 24 hours uh, rather than instantaneously because we're not presuming that they'll have internet connectivity. So we'll have to do local Wi-Fi kinds of things in order to reach that last mile, which in a disaster situation is a very big challenge. <clears throat> this is a fascinating project that NASA Ames is working on that sort of illustrates the way that you can take modern technology and bring it to bear on a very real problem. What you see here is uh, an Altair, which is the NASA version of what the military calls a predator. Uh, very long station keeping time. And the strange thing about it is if you look closely, you'll see underneath it a pod which has on the side of it <clears throat> the logo of the US Forest Service. And what we've done with this machine is we actually took it to Southern California during the fire season last year and we used it to do real-time imagery of a very large forest fire that was in an urban wildland interface and threatening a large number of homes and a lot of people. And what we were able to do is to use the Altair, and this shows you the overflight patterns, and that was able to give the people on the ground real-time imagery in terms of what was happening, because they were operating with a number of different <clears throat> portions of the of the spectrum, so they had infrared, they had visual, etc. So they could define where the hot spots were, they could define where the fire was burning the fastest, etc. And that information was pumped down with about a three minute delay between the time it was taken and made available to the people on the ground. Dramatically different real time information than we had in any other disasters that I've described to you. So instead, content, collaboration, communication, early detection response, a facilitator, independent source of information. And now we get to you folks. What can you do to make a difference in the instead world? Well, one of the things you can do is you can become a Google volunteer involved in some of these projects that I've described. Another thing that those of you particularly who are on the engineering side is recognizing as you develop, and I'm constantly amazed every time I pick up the newspaper that there's a new thing from Google, you know, my maps, whatever it is. It's just amazing the productivity of the organization that you're a part of. But as new apps come along, ask yourself, well, might this be something that we should put into the Instead toolkit? You know, would this help the people who, are, who we look to around the world to respond to disasters? Also, help us identify technology providers. As you interface with other institutions and you see that they have tools that might be useful to the Instead Toolkit, make sure that we're aware of them and basically do the introduction so that we can put more and more things in this toolkit. <clears throat> and identify disaster responder organizations that should be in the Instead Federation. Uh, I am just stunned as we continue to talk to people every single day. There's another organization that I've never heard of before that's doing really interesting, exciting disaster work. It tends to be a very fragmented community. Uh, there are some big things like, like UNICEF and there's some big things like the World Health Organization, but they're just literally tens of thousands of very small organizations that are uh, very specialized. One of the people we have running Project 3, uh, Deepak Basu, was the founder of an organization called NetHope. I and mean, what NetHope did was took a bunch of technology companies and they created a suitcase-sized <coughs> internet connection that you can take any place in the world, has a satellite antenna, and you, you can create internet connectivity in a disaster situation. Problem with it is very low bandwidth. And it's very expensive because you get charged by the, by the data bit. Uh, but it, doesn't, it begins to give us the ability to go to a disaster situation any place in the world, open up the NetHope BGAN, is what, the, what it's called. 
you open up the suitcase, orient it towards uh, the, the satellite, and you have very limited, but you do have real-time connectivity. So that's the story of Instead. And Dan's here. Um, what I'd love to do at this point is just questions, answers. Uh, do any of you uh, have any particular ideas that you'd like to share? Um, any questions about what I've said? Start in the back, move forward. The first one would love to hear more about how perhaps Dan's work with UNICEF, what the needs are. Uh, Great. You know, with, uh, here in New York, and we're obviously here listening to the public want to come to you in some way, form. So it helps with the connection. Gives you the mic and. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm kind of Mr. Disaster at UNICEF. There, we have about a $2.7 billion pro, uh, program globally, and about, as Peter said, 40, 45% of that goes for emergencies. So it's over a billion dollars a year. We're in 150 countries. We do about 350 to 400 emergencies a year. Um, from tsunami in Solomon Islands last week to um, flooding in Afghanistan. And one of the points I guess I would stress that Peter raised is you hear about, for example, Solomon Islands. It hit the newspapers. It hit the press. Um, it was 20 people killed and about 50,000 displaced. This week alone, we had 100,000 displaced and probably 34 people killed in Afghanistan from floods. No press on it, no information on it, because everyone's focused on something else. So it's a good example of what he described of, of the industry that focuses on the, the flavor of the month, if you will, the, the hot spot that hits the news, rather than the ongoing and, and the big emergencies that are, that are ongoing every day. Um, our work based here, uh, as Peter said, we have a 24-hour operations center. It tracks the world. We have about eight people who watch news in all different languages. Um, we use Google Earth. Um, we, we use it also to present to others in the organization and elsewhere to say, here's what's happening and where. Um, we both track the world and then trigger response. And so if I pick up on some of the points that Peter raised, what, what we need is, is, is less what the typical person wants to give, which I literally this morning had a woman screaming down the phone saying, I have shoes, I want to give shoes. I frankly don't need shoes. Um, what I need are better tools um, ahead of an emergency. We, we have some early warning systems. We have some preparedness kits. We have school in a box that we can transport out. I need that stuff before an emergency. I don't need shoes packed individually, et cetera, or blankets that someone wants to give what, that are 100 or 1,000. Pakistan earthquake, we need a million blankets. So a few in Santa Barbara or in New York City doesn't help me very much. So I think the things that you can do with us really are to look at what are the tools that we can use to track better. Um, we're using things like if you go on the web, you'll see FUSE, the famine early warning system of, of FAO. You'll see other types of early warning, and we're trying to pull those together. It is a disjointed industry uh, because it's kind of let a thousand flowers bloom approach, except they're blooming in 150 countries. Um, one of the big changes, which, which Peter outlined, um, if I look back 10 years ago, I was the UNICEF representative in Rwanda after the, the genocide there. And we had some big international NGOs. We had a few national and, and local NGOs. If I then fast forward to the tsunami, in Aceh alone, we had 450 NGOs working, some very skilled, some not skilled. And, and I think the industry needs some better targeting on what we do, some better tools that are accepted across the board. And we need a better integration of some of the stuff that you do as a business, which is the, the high tech capacity to analyze, synthesize, report, and, and pull those pieces of information together. Um, so I think that's where some of the partnership is pretty exciting for us. Um, here in New York, we work at a global level, obviously. I do um, a lot of speaking, but I do a lot of meetings, convincing people that, for example, Iraq is actually going downhill much faster than even you see on television. Um, and what we need to do to prepare for that, because it's going to happen. Um, trying to convince governments like Bangladesh or India or Nepal that, you know, please don't come knocking on my door to say you're surprised by flooding this year. It happens every year. 
we should actually be prepared, we should have people ready, we should have rosters of people to respond, both nationally and internationally, for that kind of context. And that's where I think some of those things where both on the early warning as well as the preparedness side and the prepositioning side, technology could help us quite a lot. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions on specific emergencies or other things, but that's kind of a quick overshot. You had a question? Types of actual volunteer involvement are you looking for and that you can actually use? Good question. I don't have a quick answer to that one. Um, in, in big emergencies, we do need volunteers and we need volunteers to man phone lines. It, it's, it's not the sexy stuff. Um, the, the stuff that happens in country, we need doctors, we need water engineers, we need nutritionists. And so if you have those skills, there may be opportunities to deploy you in those kinds of emergencies. Um, but there's a lot of background work um, that happens, in, in most cases, in very big emergencies. So it's the tsunami, it's Darfur, it's Afghanistan or Iraq. Smaller emergencies, the, the advantage of a place like UNICEF, because we are big and global, we have offices in 150 countries. And so our job is to upgrade those offices when something is about to happen or in, in a pinch after it's happened. Um, and, and there may be opportunities for that. But I, I would be honest and say I'd have to get back to you if I know more of the skills that, skill set that you have. Because I, I would also be honest and say we don't just need anybody. Um, yeah. Part of the problem in the tsunami was we had too many people who were, had great intentions but didn't necessarily have the skill sets we needed. A woman actually came up to me with a suitcase full of teddy bears and said, in Aceh, and said, I want to help. Why won't you hire me? I didn't need 35 teddy bears in, in Aceh. No. Um, and, and so it is a question of making sure that we're talking ahead of time. Um, what are your skill sets? What can you bring? And, and how do we match that? And one of the things that Google's exploring, and I can't speak for them, but I can speak about what I'm aware they're doing. Um, I had a program which was originally called Google Pioneers, and now it's going to be relabeled. But it basically, where groups of Google people would go overseas on a project basis. And one of the things that you saw in my matrix was the recovery phase. Uh, it's important to realize that you know, people think of the tsunami as something that happened over a year ago. More than half the people who lost their homes in that tsunami are still homeless. And yet, it's off of our radar screen. Is it? You know, and, and so, one of the things that I think Google might well think about is, as an institution that has incredible social commitment, you know, what about putting together teams of people who are well organized, who are well disciplined, uh, who would go into a recovery period, in, into a location in the recovery period, and make things happen. The key to making that work, though, is that you'd have to organize it in such a way that you had a sponsor like UNICEF that was able to say to the people on the ground, these people are competent, they are well-trained, they are well-equipped, and they can make a difference. You know, they are not going to show up with teddy bears. They are going to show up with the tools they need to make a difference, either to build houses or to rebuild schools or to or make a difference. So for those of you who are not on the engineering side uh, and want to get involved, I would encourage you to stimulate a discussion internally about putting together a team of people uh, who could be responsive to, to Dan and his colleagues uh, when they had a particular problem and who could be quote, certified ahead of time as being competent and capable. Um, because one of the real problems that we have in disasters is what we call convergent volunteers. And convergent volunteers are, are just a nightmare. Uh, a convergent volunteer is the person who shows up with the teddy bears or who says, hey, I'm a heart surgeon, etc." You don't have time in a disaster to figure out whether that person's a heart surgeon. Uh, you don't have time to figure out what to do with somebody who shows up and says, I've got the answer to your problems. They may well have the answer to your problems, but you don't have the time to sort that out. So if we're going to, if Google, for example, makes the decision that they want to have a team of disaster responders or disaster recovery people, they need to organize that ahead of time. They need to assure its competence. 
they need to work with an organization like UNICEF or the International Red Cross or something else uh, to establish a relationship so that when the event occurs, uh, those lead agencies know, oh, let's put a Google team in there. Uh, one of the things, for example, we're doing in Project 3 is we are creating a mobile command post that can go any place in the world that will have the best connectivity. It will basically be a mobile information center that you can put in any disaster in the world that will have high bandwidth connectivity and that will serve all of the disaster organizations that are there. That might be a wonderful thing for Google to say, hey, we'll staff that. Uh, we'll provide the people that make that thing work. And we will train those people ahead of time and we'll keep a roster of people who need to go. Now, the reality of disaster response is disaster response to be credible it has to be 24-7. For example, the urban search and rescue team that I'm responsible for, we have to be able to put 75 people out the door within four hours to go any place in the world to be self-sustained for a week. In order to do that, we have to have over 250 people who are fully trained so that in that four hour window, you can get the 75 people you need to send them out the door. So if Google, for example, said, okay, we want to have a team, a deployable team of 20 people that would run an information center, you'd need to have 60, 70, 80 people who were trained and ready to go. So that when the call came in, the people who were counting on you knew that in fact you'd be able to produce that number of people. Yes? Um, yes and no. Um, UNICEF is also part of the United Nations, and so when you read in the New York Times, the United Nations didn't do this or they didn't do that, you have to understand that the United Nations is the member state. So sometimes when the United Nations doesn't do something, it's because, for example, the U.S. stopped it from doing it. Um, and, and so on our website, for example, there's very little that will be politically sensitive. We have intranet so we have a, and, and Peter's seen it, we have a whole early warning, early action system that we share internally. Um, but publicly, it's okay to put up things like um, hurricane is coming to the Caribbean and it's likely to hit these, these days. You can actually find that information on lots of sites. If I were to put up Iraq is going to hell in a handbasket and it's really going to be at the bottom and um, Cuba, we're watching because Castro may die and this, this, this may happen we'd have some real problems. So a lot of the countries that I watch can't be on the public site and be, quote, UNICEF's estimate of what might happen. So we are talking now about, for example, putting up, which unfortunately have to be somewhat sanitized versions of what we would call our sit reps. So whether it's Zimbabwe, North Korea, Iraq, Afghanistan, where we're producing either weekly or monthly situation reports of what's happening right now, uh, we are actually looking to see how we could put that up in a public way. We, we obviously have to take a bit out. The second part of the question on, in terms of people, um, what we've tended to do rather than say, let's say we need 50 heart surgeons, or um, we, we do not unlike what Peter has described, we have what we call standby arrangements. And so we have agreements with, at the moment, about 10 different organizations, one in Australia, one in Sweden, Norway, um, India, could possibly have one here, have one in, in UK with the UK government, saying, here are the profiles of the kind of people we need. Um, if you are willing to commit with this kind of contract, we would say you can be part of the surge capacity for nutritionists, for um, IT people. We have, a, we have an agreement with a group called Telecom Sans, Sans Frontières, which is it's like uh, doctors without borders, but these are telecom people without borders. And, and they are a part of our surge for exactly some of the things, the big guns, the, the communications and IT capacity and emergency. So that's tended to be how we've, we've done it. 
what we found is if we say we need, let's just say 50 water engineers, we get about 3,000 offers. And even just wading through that in emergency is, is pretty rough. And so we've used the standby agreements to, to preset who's cleared, who's ready to go, and, and where can we call on for that expertise. So we do have that, but it's sort of standby, ready to go partners, which we could, we could do, for example, with Google, perhaps. You had a question. It was similarly OK. okay. I think the biggest difference is the, the resource base. <laughs> you know, uh, we tend as countries, both the United States and others, to invest heavily in defense. <clears throat> we tend not to make the same kind of investment in, in disaster preparedness and response. And disaster preparedness and response is usually a very poor child uh, until the disaster occurs and then everybody gets very excited but for reasons that Dan and I have both spoken to, that excitement at the time of the disaster is very difficult to convert into a, a meaningful response because it hasn't been built in a way, for example, it's not part of the, his certified surge capacity. Um, and so you can't just deal with the fact that suddenly 100 people want to do something. The, the effort that the people in Mountain View put into providing data for to cover the Katrina disaster was incredibly impressive. They basically set up a 24-7 operation. They worked with NASA. They arranged to have some special overflights done. They created all this information, and they shipped it down to Louisiana, and it never got to the people on the ground. Because the people on the ground and the people in Mountain View ahead of time had not talked and said, this is how you know, this is how we're going to just circulate the information. Let me just give you an example of how a trivial thing has a profound impact. Um, California Task Force 3, which is the task force that I'm responsible for, had the responsibility for running the entire water rescue operation in Katrina. Uh, what the Urban Search and Rescue Task Forces did years ago is they developed standard, standardized methodology when they search a building, they mark the front of the building with particular information so people know it's been searched, what was found in that building, et cetera. And so the next person that comes by knows that that building doesn't need to be searched again. So here they are in, at Katrina, and they're going up house by house and marking the front of these houses. And then the next day, someone comes along in a helicopter, can't see the front of the house, doesn't know whether the house has been searched or not puts somebody on the roof and searches the same house again. You know, how wonderful it would have been if everybody had a PDA with GPS capability and they just entered that information at the time they searched the building and within 30 seconds it went on to Google Earth and anybody who was running an, a, an, an, an airborne operation could see what the, sea, the water based operation had done and vice versa. Uh, but they had none of that capability. We sent these people out the, out the door with cell phones and satellite phones. Nothing worked. The cell phone system had basically been degraded by the, by the floods, and the satellite system was totally tied up by the networks. The networks all showed up. <clears throat> they would open up a channel on the satellite phone system, and they'd keep it open 24-7. There were no channels left for the emergency responders. They had a, cell, they had a satellite phone that didn't work. Um, and so, you know, those are the kinds of problems you've got to solve ahead of time. You know, and, and if you don't solve them ahead of time, then the people in the field do what they do with what they've got. And one of the real problems also is that the disaster community is not a, it's not a community where culturally it's acceptable to say, I need this, I need that. It's a group of people who are used to operating under resource constrained basis. And so you have to talk to these people for a long time before they say, well, gee, it really would be nice if I could have some water <laughs> uh, or some basic thing. So you have to push these people hard because their attitude is, look, we signed up to be in this business. We're going to go out the door with what we've got. And 
we don't spend a lot of our time thinking about what we don't have. And so one of the dialogues that's taking place in the consultation process is bringing technology people together with responders. And you know, you saw this incredible operation that's been pulled off by the NASA Ames people. I mean, and, and you don't need a predator airborne platform. Um, we had a meeting with the NASA Ames people last week, and they're now in the process of creating a pod that can be put on the, the bottom of a small fixed wing airplane or a helicopter. And basically, we can take these pods and give them to Dan or any place, anybody else, and say, hey, take this any place in the world, put this on the bottom of an airport, airborne platform, and the data that's connected, it's going to come down, it's going to be digitized photographs that are GPS correlated, and within 30 minutes, we'll be able to put it up on, a, on Google Earth. And all you have to do is just do a simple flyover, uh, and that data will be collected and it will be displayed. Uh, if you ask a disaster responder if they wanted that kind of thing, uh, they'd sort of scratch their head because they said, well, I've never had that. What do you mean? But then you begin to show them what we were able to do uh, with the Forest Service pod. Uh, and it was incredible because instead of the old way of doing it is that you'd send out each of the section bosses on the fire line uh, would, would do a physical map and send it into the operations center and people would then say okay this is the this is where the fire lines were six hours ago these are reports from our section bosses and you had information that's typically six to twelve hours old and suddenly we put them in a situation where they had information that was three minutes old uh, it was totally you know totally different world uh, and dramatically increased their ability to do their job but it took technology people sitting down with responders to say, here's a place where we can make a difference. The other point I'd raise, how we are very different from military, um, and that's again comes back to this UN side, we work with governments. Um, a military operation primarily goes in to take over and do things. And I think one of the, the what we see in most emergencies is that our role is also to figure out how do we help government do what it should be doing better. Whether it's Katrina, where UNICEF actually helped with some of the education opportunities there, or it's in um, Afghanistan, how do we make sure that the government can provide education services that it should be providing anyway? Um, and in some countries they can't for resource reasons, and others they can't for access reasons. And so we're not a foreign occupying set of people we're, we're actually there figuring out if the Ministry of Health is to run the clinics the way it should. It may mean that MSF or Oxfam or somebody else has to run them for a couple of weeks. But the goal is to get the government to be doing it again or to get private sector to do it again and actually have it be a self-sustaining system. So that's a big difference from sort of a military force that would go in and do it and leave. And the other difference with the military is that they tend to have pretty much total control of the situation. And most of the disaster situations that Dan and I are familiar with, no one has total control. It's almost chaos. Um, a good example is Oklahoma City. When the bombing occurred there, that was a federal building on federal property. It was very easy to determine who was in charge. It was a whole new ball game when the World Trade Center occurred because then you had the city of New York, the state of New York, the federal government, um, the lines of command and control were incredibly screwed up. Um, our guys showed up um, as part of one of the many urban search and rescue teams that came to New York City um, and basically could not establish any degree of rapport with the local people because they were perceived as being outsiders, because they wore these FEMA uniforms. And so the first night that they got here, they said, hey, send us Menlo Park Fire Department t-shirts. They put those on the next day, totally different attitude. They were firefighters <laughs> and totally accepted by their New York brethren. Uh, interesting little cultural thing. And so those are the kinds of issues that you face in a disaster situation. Uh, you have to be incredibly sensitive to local culture. Uh, you have to recognize that what people need and what you think they need are sometimes very different. 
Uh, it's one of the reasons why it's really important that the people you put in on the scene are people who are, who are properly certified and properly trained. Um, one of the real challenges in Aceh uh, was that you had so many people there who really had no business being there, and they became a resource depleter rather than a resource provider. programs, educational or training or, you know, this kind of bureaucratic program to help harness that manpower that exists. I mean, I feel like, especially nowadays, people in, you know, my generation really do find this, you know, want to have this civic give back, want to be able to do it and not just write a check. So what kind of steps can we take to not only become better educated ourselves, but create programs that help to train others like us and to do that? Aside from the one you mentioned, which is in Google, but just in general, there's such a big population of people, and there's nothing worse than turning away people who want to help when obviously they have something to give, but if they could be trained or taught or figured out the best way to use them, it can benefit everybody. So what, what's kind of the thought process on that? How, how can that really work further? Well, the challenge that you, that you raise is that how do you marry that desire to make a difference uh, with the ability to present yourself to the disaster manager as an asset rather than a liability. And my many years of being involved in this, I began my life as a smoke jumper for the Forest Service, literally jumping out of airplanes, putting out forest fires. And the only way that that kind of thing works well is you have to have it organized and you have to have it trained. And individual people who want to make a difference, by and large, are a handicap rather than an asset in a disaster situation. So I would say to you uh, and to other people who want to make a difference, what you need to try to do is find a way to organize ahead of time, either in a corporate setting or in a neighborhood setting, uh, so that you become a known dependable, certified resource that other people can call upon. Uh, on the 1st of July, for example, when we post this citizen's training manual for pandemics, one of the things that you can do as an individual is to take that training manual and say, okay, I'm gonna work with my neighbors and I'm gonna create the ability for our neighborhood to take care of itself. Because if we have a pandemic, you are gonna be on your own. The world as we know it is gonna change. Uh, we've run the numbers in California. We're going to need 14 times the number of hospital beds that we have. Well, that isn't going to happen. And if you don't have 14 times the number of hospital beds, what's going to happen? It means that individuals and families and neighborhoods are going to have to take care of themselves. And it gets a bit grim because, you know, we have a wonderful system in our country of getting rid of dead bodies. When was the last time you ever saw a dead body being moved from the place where the person died. It happens very nicely, discreetly. If we have a pandemic, that's not gonna occur. One of the things you're gonna have to learn to deal with in your community, in your family, in your neighborhood, is what do you do with dead bodies? Because there's not gonna be somebody to come pick them up. Um, so, if you as an individual wanna make a, a difference in a disaster situation, I think you have to find a way to get involved in an institution or create an institution uh, which is credible and certifiable and has a relationship with someone like UNICEF, the Red Cross, et cetera, who's responsible for responding to these disasters and you become part of their surge capability. I guess I would add that it's also about skills. Um, if I came to you and said, I'd really love to, to help at Google, can I volunteer three days a week? You'd say, but one, you're kind of old, and two, you don't have the skill set. <laughs> <laughs> and, and disaster prevention, disaster response, as disorganized as it, as it looks and as it sometimes is, it is a business. Um, and so, for example, my niece, who wants to be involved, I've said to her, one of the things we need more of are people in UNICEF, are people who are specialists on child protection. 
How do you find kids who've lost their parents in an emergency? How do you help kids who've seen their parents killed or their house burned down? How do you get kids out of the military when they've been recruited? Um, that's an area that is absolutely a growth industry. Uh, we don't have enough people. It's a new area, and, and we need more people who know it, who have experience in it, et cetera. So there are some areas in the business of disaster response where there are opportunities if you're really interested in going deeper. And it probably means doing a master's degree or going out and getting some volunteer experience overseas. It's not just something you can say, I want to help. And, and so I guess I would say, don't belittle the, we asked you for money. Because without the money, we can't do it. Um, and that is a tremendous contribution. And the second thing I would say is don't stop your interest. You know, talk to your friends, talk to them about dinner, or go to, to films and, and, and keep interested and get other people interested. The biggest frustration I have living here in the US, having lived a very long time overseas, is one of the, the most common questions I get is, how's Africa? How's the moon? How's, you know, how do I respond to that? That's actually the wrong question to ask to even start a conversation. Um, and so help people figure out what are some of the right conversations by reading more, talking to people, going to lectures, whatever, if that really is one of your interests. Um, or if you're truly, truly interested, you know, do a, a master's degree in whether it's business administration because you want to do logistics and finance and whatever, or it's child protection or it's refugee law. There, there are lots of different areas if, if you want to go further than that. You know, again, I, I think I'd pick up on the point that Dan makes about expertise. And I think one of the things that is most useful to the disaster responder managers <clears throat> is having groups of people who have very well-defined certified skill sets. You know, Doctors Without Borders is an example. The IT Without Borders is another example. Uh, there's an organization in San Francisco that we're collaborating with called the Fritz Institute. Uh, and they specialize in logistics. Um, I'm meeting with them next week, and one of the things that I want to explore with them is, can we create surge capacity within corporations where Dan and his colleagues say, gee, we need a logistics team in country X. Uh, send us a team of people who can basically run the logistics for this operation. And these are people who really are experienced in doing that kind of thing. And so they go on the ground, and they have the tools. And, and they're self-contained. And they're not a depletion of resources, but they, in fact, help solve the problem and create the problem. Um, so I think what you want to do is you want to build around institutional capabilities. And you'll want to recognize that the disaster managers are interested in, as Dan emphasizes, uh, a, a capability, uh, and individuals are very hard to manage in a disaster situation. It's just very inefficient if you have to manage 50 independent individuals. Much better to be able to say, okay, this is a team of 50 people who are self-contained, self-organized, we know how they operate, we know what their skills are, and we only have to deal with the team leader. Uh, and we can give them an assignment and off they go and we know they're going to do the job right. Just, just as maybe a, a final concrete example of that, uh, UNICEF is constantly moving millions of tons of blankets and medical kits and school supplies. I just find it ironic that every time we have an emergency, I have to find logistics teams, and I have a few around the world, et cetera, and we do that for this emergency. And yet I know there's Unilever and Procter and & Gamble and DHL and all these other companies that do that for profit and do it exceedingly well. And I keep wondering, why can't we figure this one out? Why am I hiring all these people? And I'd, I'd come back to you. I'm also trying to make sure that we have communications and the right kind of pr early warning and prevention on the IT front. And so I'm kind of hiring in and trying to beg, borrow, and steal. And yet, that's your company's business. And you do it incredibly well. So what I'm actually more interested in, will I come to Google at some point and say, you know, I need your money? Probably. I'm, I also, my job is fundraising. But what I'm, what I'm really interested in is how do we harness what is your core business for different kinds of purposes? And that's where I think this is, is an exciting partnership. So other questions? 
And thank you so much for sort of sticking with it. We've gone a little bit longer than the hour and uh, <clears throat> Megan has my contact information. Um, those of you who'd like to be involved, uh, let her know, and she'll get you in touch with either Dan or myself. Uh, and remember what was on that last slide. Um, you know, basically, there are lots of things you can do. You can get involved as an individual, but you need to find some sort of a structure to do that. Um, if you're working on Google Apps, uh, constantly ask yourself, is there some way in which this application can be useful and meaningful to the disaster community? And if so, push it uh, to the INSTEAD team to make sure that we include it in the toolkit. If you're aware of other technology providers that you think bring something important to the table, make sure we know who they are. Uh, and if you're involved with any organizations that you think could profit from these kinds of things, again, you know, connect us to them. So thank you very much. Dan, thank you for coming. Perfect. Nice yeah. to see you.